Hello everyone and welcome back to yet another video. My name is Juan Londoño and today we are reviewing a lens. So I'm going to try to go through the name of this thing without any interruptions and that means without pausing the video and correcting myself. This is the beast we're talking about here. This is the Sigma 60 to 600 millimeter f 4.5 to 6.3 DG HSM Sport. And basically it's a 10 time super telephoto zoom lens and it's a beast. Now, if you think that was a mouthful, you should try carrying this thing. Now we're gonna go over a few categories. Some of the things we're not gonna look at are charts. We're not gonna pixel peep. We're not gonna do any of that. I, I'm not telling you not to do it. I recommend that you do it. If you're interested in this lens seriously, then check out some reviews where they pixel peep. They look at the sharpness in the corners. I purchased this after already going through all those reviews, so I can tell you that it's an excellent lens. It doesn't mean it, that it's a perfect lens. Maybe it doesn't, it doesn't have everything that you need, so please check those out. What we're going to do today, we're going to check a few categories, including a bunch of images at the end of this video that are going to show you what this thing is capable of. Um, we're also going to look at some images throughout the video where we discuss like bokeh and what 60 and 600 looks like, right, relative to each other. So we'll look at that as well. We're going to talk about all the buttons, all the functionality, everything this thing comes with. And basically, from somebody who's been shooting for over 30 years, uh, the practicality, the ease of use, and just, you know, does this inspire you to actually use it or does this become cumbersome and kind of end up in your closet? Before we get started, let me just say that Sigma did not send me this lens um, for, well, they sent me the lens because I bought it. They didn't send me the lens for trial purposes. They didn't ask me to review it. Uh, nobody did. I bought this lens after watching a bunch of videos and I thought it was an incredible lens. And I spoke to a couple of people and they had tried it, they had rented it and loved it. So I went ahead and bit the bullet and no regrets. So I just want you to know, I did not get paid for this. I am gonna include a link so you can buy this lens if you're interested after seeing this review. It's an affiliate link, so I get a little something, but you don't pay a penny more, okay? So if you do buy it from there, thank you ahead of time. This lens came out in 2018, and I'm gonna take this cap off because I wanna show you what it looks like on a full frame DSLR. So you can kind of get an idea of the size of this thing. Now you should see this thing on the camera that's recording this video. It's the Canon M6 Mark II. It's a tiny, small, little mirrorless camera. Hanging on to this lens, it looks like it's holding on for dear life, that poor little camera. This is a big lens. It, we'll talk about the specs in a minute, but this is what it looks like on a, on a full frame DSLR, okay? It's comfortable because it's a full frame DSLR. It's a nice big camera, feels very good. Um, let's go into the details. Some of the topics we're gonna cover today, and I'm gonna look at them real quick here in my notes. We're gonna go over size and weight, build quality, we're gonna discuss the features that this thing has. Um, accessories, we're going to go over image quality and the performance of the lens. We're gonna talk about its shortcomings and we'll discuss price and then final thoughts, including who is this thing for? And like I said, if you stick around, you're gonna see some amazing pics. So let's begin with size and weight. This thing is six pounds heavy. Um, Jared Poland did a review of this lens, and Jared's a tough, strong guy, and he holds this thing like it's a, you know, a can of Coke. You know, I'm 170 pounds, I'm 6'1". This thing is heavy. I'm, I'm thin, but I'm strong. And <laughs> on a two pound camera, a six pound lens is eight pounds. When I shot at the air show, I had this thing in my hand, and I was shooting airplanes for seven hours, from nine in the morning till 4 p.m. And I got home and went to bed that night. I was tired. But the next day, I felt like I had gone to the gym for two hours and just worked on shoulders. It is that heavy. Now, I'm not telling you not to buy it for that reason. You know that if you're going to be shooting this, you may be on a gimbal, you may be on a monopod or a tripod. Uh, if you're shooting birds, maybe a monopod is sufficient, even airplanes. Uh, I just like the freedom, so I, I didn't want to. I took a tripod with me but I ended up just not using it. I actually had a monopod as well. Um, but most people are gonna use this thing on a tripod, so don't, don't let that discourage you. In terms of carrying it around, then you're gonna to have to think about that. If you're planning on hiking with this thing in a backpack, then you wanna think about that. Let's look at the size. This thing grows, now it's got the lens hood on right now, but it grows from 10 and a half inches, take the lock off, 
to, what is it, 24 inches. This is a beast. In every sense of the word, it's a beast. It's almost five inches in diameter, 4.7 something, 0.74, 0.75. It's just a big lens. And the good thing is that it's a sport lens, so it's built rough, uh, built tough, and, um, and it feels really good in the hands. For build quality, well, so it is a sport lens, right? And that means a couple of things. It means it's weather sealed, so it's beautiful because if it's drizzling a little bit or raining a little bit, if it's a little dusty, you don't have to worry too much, right? Um, it also means that it's made for the outdoors, which not just about ruggedness, but about light. You need a lot of light to operate this thing. You're working at f4.5 at 60 millimeters, but at 300, right around the 300, it already goes to its, its minimum, you know, uh, or, you know, it goes to 6.3, a maximum aperture of 6.3. So from 300 to 600, you're already bound to 6.3. So you need light. Can you shoot it indoors? Yes, of course. You're going to have to jack up your ISO. Um, but, you know, you can, you can use it if it's bright inside. If it's not, you're going to have some issues. Um, the lens has a little bit of a problem focusing if it gets dark. Otherwise, if you're shooting this thing in the daylight, it's beautiful. Let me go into the details. Like I said, you can pull these up on, on their site and on many places where you can buy this lens, but I just want to go over these. So it has one special low dispersion element, SLD. It has three F low dispersion elements, uh, and that's basically to minimize the chromatic aberration and color, um, color fringing. Now this thing does have a, a metal mount. Um, you know, I mean, really, I don't have to show you. You can take my word for it, but we're already here. Let's do it. It has a metal mount. It has to have a metal mount. If this thing had a plastic mount, it would just crack right off because of the weight of this thing. Um, you see what I'm doing here? I'm holding this thing with uh, the, the camera straps. Don't ever hold something this heavy from the camera. This is just because I keep the camera, right now it was in the closet and I was using it for something else uh, with a smaller lens, but there are ways of adjusting a camera strap to the lens itself, and we'll go over that later. This thing has super multi-layer coating, and that's basically to control flare and ghosting. And it has a hypersonic motor for quick and quiet focusing. Hypersonic motor, that's what the HSM stands for in the name. And the DG means the lens is made for a full frame digital body. Keep in mind though, what I told you earlier, I'm using it as well on a crop camera, uh, crop sensor. So you just have to get a, a converter, an adapter for that. And we're going to show you pictures of what you, you get when you put this thing on a crop size sensor. Continuing with the build of this thing, intelligent optical stabilization. So it doesn't just have optical stabilization. According to Sigla, it has intelligent optical stabilization uh, with up to four stops of correction to minimize, you know, camera shake. So that's basically because of the size of this thing. You know, you got to remember the elements, the glass elements, and they're pretty big too. So something that heavy, um, I'm going to show you a video later, and it's really windy at the lake when I filmed it, just so you can see how, you know, the wind smacks this thing, and it kind of wants to take it out of your hand. So um, optical stabilization is very, very important on a lens this size. As I mentioned earlier, a weather-resistant design, design against dust and moisture, that's incredibly important because you're going to be outdoors. And here's something really cool. It's got a water and oil repellent coating on the front and rear glass elements. And that's basically to prevent moisture, fingerprints, and smudges. So I would still, you know, we'll talk about filters later. There's another video dedicated to filters coming later in the year, but you might want to consider putting a nice, good filter on the tip of this thing. And we'll talk about that as well in detail. But um, that'll give you the extra protection in the front element. But knowing that it's got this repellent coating is nice. Now, here's something you're going to like. This thing is built using three different materials. So the inside of this thing is a magnesium alloy core, right? And it's got to be metal because this thing is rugged. It's for outdoors. It's holding all those glass elements. It needs to be tough. It needs to be strong. Um, the outside of this thing is the interesting material. It's a thermally stable composite, TSC. So the outside of, thing, of this thing is made out of a plastic that basically doesn't move around much, doesn't expand and contract a whole lot when it gets very hot and very cold. So the glass elements, if you go out into the sun and you're shooting in the Mojave Desert and it's 115 degrees, this thing is going to get hot, of course, because it's black, 
but it's not going to move around, expand so much that your glass elements are going to move and your pictures are going to go from focus to, to blurry, right? That's not going to happen thanks to that material. And of course, a carbon fiber hood, which, um, which is nice to have because then the end of this, which is the heavy part, especially when you extend this thing, right? Um, your arm is way out there. You don't want that to be extra heavy. I mean, that glass element is already pretty heavy. So that um, carbon fiber hood, beautiful. It has nine rounded aperture blades and I'll show you some bokeh pictures later. Uh, it's not perfect bokeh, but it's pretty decent. Now let's go into the features. The features of the lens are as follows. The features of the lens, we'll start with everything on the lens, okay? Um, the lock button. So there is a lock button, it's on this side, and when you take it off, it allows you to change the focal length, right? If you put it on, you can no longer adjust the focal length. Why is that important? Well, it's important if you find a focal length you like, you can just lock it, and then you can just worry about focusing if you're manually focusing this thing if it's autofocus then the camera will do the focusing but it's locked into that focal length the other thing is your lens doesn't kind of droop if you take this thing off look what happens you see it's gravity's pulling it down right and if you put this on a table and you don't want to keep playing with this back and forth because it's going to get worn out over time I mean it's gonna get worn out by using it but in your bag you don't want it dancing around like that so put the lock on when you don't plan on moving it around too much the tripod mount this thing this tripod mount is a handle I mean this is how I hold my camera when I'm walking around right this is this is the handle that I hold this this whole setup with um, it's an Arca Swiss so you can put it on your on your um, tripod if you have an Arca Swiss tripod without having to worry about attaching anything to this right you just drop it in and you're set another beautiful feature of this handle is that there's a screw here that I can adjust I can loosen and this camera will pivot to portrait position and it clicks into place and then I can tighten it back check this out listen see how that clicks so it's beautiful for many reasons. I can go into portrait and I can go back into landscape very easily, but here's another beautiful reason. People are complaining that they're having trouble focusing this because this handle's in the way and that even when they're zooming, it's in the way. I don't find the zooming to be a problem, but you know what? Get it out of the way and just tighten it out of place. And now this thing is at the top and see if, I don't know if it'll focus, but this thing, Make sure that it focuses my face back because I have been having problems with that. And then it's out of the way. You can, you can play with this. And later on, if you need to put it back on a tripod, you put it back into place. So a lot of flexibility with this handle. On the bottom of this handle, there are two holes. One is a one quarter, which is a standard. And the other one is a three eighths for bigger tripods, like a lot of the cinema tripods. Going to autofocus, we have three different modes. We have autofocus, AF. We have the manual override. MO and then we have just manual focus MF so autofocus manual override and manual focus um, you know most lenses will just have autofocus and manual focus so the manual override is really nice this lens also has a focus limiter button um, you know and I, I can't show you much from here but you can see in, in, in this separate little video um, the, the focus limiter button will go to full which is the full range of the lens it will go to um, six meters to infinity. So if you know that everything you're focusing is greater than six meters and to infinity, then you keep it there if nothing's close up to you, right? The last button this camera has um, is the custom settings. So there are three modes on this button. There's off, there's custom one, and there's custom two. Now I keep these off because I haven't uh, programmed them yet. But basically what you're gonna need is you're gonna need the uh, optional USB dock. Now, you can buy it for about 50 US dollars, or if you haven't bought the lens yet, then what you wanna do is you wanna buy the lens as a kit, and it includes the dock, and you only pay a couple dollars more. So it's a fantastic deal. You're going to need the dock. Let me read to you the purpose of these buttons, what you can do with them. So you can, obviously it's custom settings, right? So when using the USB dock, you can change and save the autofocus speed and optical stabilization effect and range of the focus limiter. So 
it's wonderful for, you know how we were talking about the, um, the different focus limiter modes? Well, you can adjust those. It doesn't have to be from six meters to infinity. You can make it whatever you want. You can adjust the focusing. You can do so many things. Let's now move into the lenses accessories. Some of these come with the lens and some of these you have to buy. So as I mentioned before, camera strap. You can take the camera strap off your camera. You don't have to buy another camera strap. And there are holes in the lens so that you can put this camera strap on the lens. And when you're carrying this on your shoulder, you're actually holding it from an eight pound lens and not from a two pound camera, which is a much better idea. So you'll have to buy the camera strap. It doesn't come with a camera strap. I mean, with a lens strap. Um, the USB dock, as we mentioned, is optional, but it's important for two reasons. One is calibrating the lens. Of course, you know, adjusting the custom settings, right? And calibrating it. I put those together because, uh, but they're really separate. So calibrating the lens is, many people are complaining that when they put this lens on and they focus something, it focuses either a little behind or a little in front. Well, you can mitigate that by buying a little focusing thing, which costs like five or six dollars. It's a cardboard with all these colors, I mean, dots on it and stuff in squares. And, and you put it on a table and you set a tripod up about eight feet back and you can calibrate your lens. So that's a very important and you get perfect, perfectly sharp pictures for your camera. The other reason for the USB dock is basically software updates. Don't overlook those. You know, Sigma's putting out software updates for their lenses all the time. And you know, if your lens can focus faster or even a little sharper, why not, right? Let's talk about the case. This lens comes with a really beefy case. And, you know, I don't see a lot of practicality behind this. Maybe I'm wrong. Let me know in the comments if you found a really good use for it. I'm not saying it's a bad case. This is rugged. The inside insulation is tough as heck, and it brings all kinds of stuff in here to keep your lens protected. Um, it has a strap, and if you were carrying this, so basically, if I was carrying this DSLR with like a 24 millimeter and I was doing landscape shooting, I could technically keep this on my back, on my back. And then when I need it, I could pull it out and it would always be safe. Maybe that's a use for it. Personally, I have other ways I'd rather carry that lens. I'd rather get a small backpack because then I can throw other stuff in there and I throw the lens in there. So, you know, I don't know. But it brings this really, really cool lens cap hood. Let me show you how this thing works. So you don't really leave your, your, um, your lens hood on here. It doesn't, I mean, you can, there's nothing stopping you from doing this and putting it on, right? And then Velcroing this thing. But remember the knob for removing this thing? This knob actually needs to be on the top. My bird's freaking out today, the, the day I'm doing the video, out of all the days. So you see now, this knob is on the top, not on the bottom. So when you, when you put this thing in, it's going, to, it's going to match over here with the hole in the little case. And now when you walk around with this, if you bump it into things, it's protected. It's really cool. I think this is nice if you're carrying the lens around, if you're hiking, and you know that this is the, really the only lens you're going to be needing, or maybe some other small lens in your pocket. Uh, this is wonderful. You take this off, and then you can just invert, you know, invert the, the hood and you're done, set to go. And remember both that hood and that cap for the hood come with the cam, with the lens. Let's go into the handling of this beast. So one, focusing ring. The focusing ring is very smooth. There's just enough resistance that it doesn't, you know, you don't accidentally tap it and it goes off center here. Um, very smooth. Some people were saying that, you know, they don't see themselves ever using this for video because uh, zooming this thing in and out, it's kind of uh, choppy. I don't find any choppiness at all. This is a very, very smooth ring. Again, this tripod mount is in the way, so I would just get this thing out of the way and now I am free. I am free to just focus that tripod mount and if you're righty, well, if you're... <laughs> If you're, sorry, lefty, I mean, you're kind of SOL because you still have to hold the camera this way. But um, no, very, very nice focusing ring. The zoom ring is kind of in the same boat. It feels tight. I can't move it because I have the lock on. It feels tight, maybe a little tighter than the focusing ring. Uh, again, if you're good um, and you've eaten your Wheaties this morning and you've worked out regularly, uh, you're not going to have any problem bringing this in 
relatively smoothly. And I'm thinking that with time, it's going to get even smoother. It is a little firm. I don't mind that. But even, even as firm as it is, it still does this where this lens will just drip, right? And um, so you definitely need that lock that we were talking about. You see how that just moves, right? So you want to lock it when you're not using it. But here's the cool thing about this lens. Some lenses don't let you do this. You can grab the end and it, it's got a groove here so your finger feels really good and you can just pull it out. And I did this when I was shooting the planes. I would follow them from 600 millimeters. They land and then they come really close to me and I'd zoom in to 60. Really, really nice feature to have. And definitely when you're not using it, back to the lock. Now let's talk about image quality. This is what the images look like. First, we're going to start with 60 millimeter, and you're going to see that at 60 millimeter, it's uh, it's a 60 millimeter lens, right? The sign out in, in on the lake is kind of far out, and um, when you bring it in on the computer to 100%, you're going to see that it's not the sharpest in the world. And this is one of my one of my um, shortcomings uh, of this lens. One of my beefs with this lens is that between 60 and 150, that it's not a little sharper. So you see that at 60, when I bring that up to 100%, it's not as sharp as it can be. The same thing for the 100 millimeter. 100 millimeter, you're bringing it in a little closer, that sign, and it's still, when you bring it into 100% on the computer, uh, it's still a little soft. At 150 millimeters, um, it looks a little closer, of course, but then you go to 100% on the computer and there's still some softness. After that, at 200 and, and all the way to 600, I'm not going to show you the 100% because at that point, the lens is perfectly sharp. It's a beautiful, beautiful lens. So this is what the image looks like at 200. And by the way, 200 millimeters on this lens is where you get the maximum magnification of 0.3. So the closest focus, right? And, and the maximum magnification. That's where you can get the closest, at 200 millimeters. That's very, very good to know. Going to 300, this is what the image looks like at 300. Then we go to 400, right? And we're getting definitely closer. At 500, we're up on that sign. And then at 600 millimeters. And it's very sharp at 600 millimeters. Now, just for comparison, because this is a 10-time beast, um, this is what it looks like at 60 next to 600. And that is a huge difference. That is the beauty of having a 10 time zoom lens. Now, just for fun, I took the M6 Mark II, which is filming this video, and I put it on this lens. That's kind of how you have to word it with this lens. It's not putting the lens on the camera because the camera weighs less than a pound. The lens is six pounds. So I'm putting the camera on the lens, right? And it's a crop sensor camera. So I multiply by 1.6 because it's Canon. So my 60 to 600 becomes a 96 to 960 millimeters. That's almost 1,000. Now, I lost on the low end, right? I'm no longer 60 millimeters, I'm 96. But if you're shooting things that are very far away, that's what you want to do. People say, oh, full frame is better than crop. Well, it depends what you need. If you're trying to get close to things, then you want a crop, uh, a crop sensor, right? Because that sensor is going to give you 96 to 960. So let me put these pictures side by side. First of all, let me show you the 96 next to the 960. That's what the two pictures look like of the same sign, right? And that's shot on the M6 Mark II from Canon. Now I'm going to show you what the um, full frame 60 to 600 looks like. And underneath it, you're going to see the crop size, the crop sensor, uh, 96 to 960, which is basically the same 60 to 600 on a crop sensor camera, right? So 60 to 600 on the top with the full frame, 60 to 600 on the bottom with a crop sensor camera. Big difference, isn't it? Okay, it just occurred to me that I left something out of the script. I was supposed to talk about the image stabilization and what it looked like um, at 600 millimeters when it's on and when it's off. So I apologize for that. That's why you're looking at, um, I had already powered down and I had already taken the lights away. So this is why it looks a little different, but let's talk about that now real quick and add it in here because this is where it belongs. So right off the bat with image stabilization off, you can see that I am getting kicked around this lake. Um, 
the winds were howling, it was cold as heck, just a really bad day to be doing this, but uh, excellent day to make a point. And I was struggling to keep this lens at 600 millimeter, uh, millimeters still enough to do anything. You know, if I had to record an actual video at 600 millimeters, I would have been screwed. Now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna show you the same video. Well, you know, uh, not the same video, but the, a video taken at the same place of the same subject. And this time, uh, intelligent optical stabilization will be on. And it's not perfectly still, but remember, what are the chances that I'm gonna be shooting 600 millimeters handheld uh, video, right? It's not gonna happen. It's gonna be on a tripod for sure, or on some kind of, uh, you know, of a gadget, whether it's a monopod or whatever it is, right? Um, but you can see it's a really big difference. Uh, and I'm just playing it over and over so you can see, right? Uh, I can actually get footage, I can read, um, so overall, this uh, intelligent optical stabilization does make a huge difference. If it wasn't as windy and I was at, say, 100 millimeters or even 60 millimeters, which is actually more appropriate for doing a video or, you know, yeah, on this lens, um, I would have had no problem and it would have looked completely normal. So there you have it. Talking about bokeh now. Bokeh is interesting on this camera. I played with it outdoors, but I didn't get really serious shots that I wanted to share with you guys. So I did a few inside. It was a little dark inside. These were pictures of my daughter, but I did them at 60 and then I did them at 600. I didn't do anything in between just because I wanted to see the extremes. At 60, it looks very normal. Um, I got as close as I could to her and you can see these lights hanging over the, you know, my stereo system in the background. And eh, they look, you know, Nothing spectacular, they're still kind of small, you know, no big bokeh balls. But I put this thing on 600 and I had to step all the way into the corner of the kitchen, basically jam my head into the cabinets so I can fit just her, her you know, her head in the picture. And now you can see really nice bokeh. Now the bokeh is not perfectly round. For nine aperture blades, I was a little surprised. I expected it to see a little more round bokeh balls, but, but it's not bad by any means. And I'm thinking that uh, well, actually, what I saw outside, uh, which was light coming through the trees, it looked rounder and it looked a lot prettier. But like I said, I didn't have a good subject, so I didn't want to share those with you. Um, but bokeh is not bad at all. Um, if you have bigger lights inside, I think it's going to be rounder and they're going to be prettier as well. These were just very small little Christmas lights. Focusing on this lens is actually very quick for its size. When you go from a short distance to a far distance, uh, it does it effortlessly and it locks on pretty quick. It doesn't really do a lot of hunting unless you really get into low light situations. Then it hunts around looking for focus. But overall, for the price and for the size of this beast, it's wonderful. So shortcomings. Well, the elephant in the room, right? The thing is big. It's a big lens. And some people, you know, will talk about the specs and talk about all this thing and they don't really talk much about it, but it's something to talk about. Why? Because if you have shoulder issues, I know people that have bad shoulders, this might be a problem if you're thinking about shooting freehand. Um, if you don't plan on putting this thing on a monopod or tripod, some kind of gimbal uh, device on a, on a tripod, gimbal head, I should say, um, it's going to be very difficult to hold this for an extended period of a time. So if you're one of those people that has problems with your arms or shoulders, uh, if you're very frail or weak, whatever, um, this is going to be a challenge. You might want to think about a slightly smaller lens, uh, whether it's a Sigma or, you know, native lens for your camera. The slow aperture, well, you know, you buy this lens knowing what you're getting, right? F4.5 to 6.3 is not the end of the day if I know I'm shooting outside. I'm shooting mostly airplanes and uh, just really far things when I'm looking at landscapes, um, flowers out in the middle of ponds. So to me, I'm out in the daylight most of the time. It's not a problem for me. I'm not shooting indoor sports. I'm not shooting in dark locations. I'm not doing weddings anymore. Uh, so not a problem, but as long as you know what you're buying, it's not gonna be an issue. People complain about things that seem irrelevant to me. Like people are saying, well, it would have been nice if they did like an 18 to 600, yeah. And it would be nice if you know somebody gave me a million dollars tomorrow, but you can't always get these things, right? It doesn't make sense. This lens is already six pounds and it's $2,000. If this lens went from say 24 to 600, it would probably be 12 pounds. It would be double the weight 
it would be a diameter of like eight inches and it would weigh like five or six grand or, or maybe more than that. So Sigma's trying to keep this lens affordable and they're trying to keep it practical. So just keep that in mind. A lot of these, a lot of these complaints didn't make a lot of sense. So um, you know what you're getting into and for the money, it's a perfect lens. Well, you know, not perfect, but it's, it's excellent. Other complaints along those lines are it could have been lighter, uh, you know, all these things, right? The real complaint that I have with this lens is that from 60 to 150, it's soft. I wish that Sigma had made a little more effort in making it sharp. I don't know what the physics behind. Maybe it was really difficult to do that without spending another, making you pay another thousand dollars for it, you know? I'm sure they're, they're a smart company and they did the best they could, but um, it's the only issue I have. Now, price. This thing comes in at... 1999 US dollars and 99 cents, I think. Uh, it's $2,000, right? So a Canon 70 to 200 for their RF mount is about $2,500. So yes, you're getting a 2.8, but it's 28. I mean, sorry, it's 70 to 200. This is a 60, it's even wider to 600. I mean, you're getting short of a miracle here for, for cheaper. So, you know, am I comparing apples to oranges? Eh, maybe, but. I don't think so. I think this is, you're going to buy a 70 to 200. If you're using it for weddings and a lot of indoor stuff, that's the lens you need. You need a 2.8. But if you're going to shoot outside and you want birds and airplanes and that 70 to 200, 70 to 200 is going to be kind of useless. You're going to need this 60 to 600. And in that case, it's $500 cheaper. If I wanted Sigma to make a lens that was as sharp as that Canon 70 to 200, 2.8, uh, in all, you know, in all the range, then it would probably start at $3,800 instead of $2,000. So another thing, they're just trying to be practical and affordable. So basically, it's not a cheap lens, but in retrospect, it can be a lot more expensive. So who is this lens for, right? So the, the, the final thoughts, by the way, were that this, this lens, uh, for the money, won't disappoint you. Let, let's start with that first, the final thoughts. For the money, this lens will not disappoint you. Um, but we have to look at the second part to that, which is who is this lens for? So we said it's a sports lens, so it's definitely for outdoor use, also because of its speed, right? 4.5 to 6.3, f4.5 to 6.3 is not very fast. So you're gonna be limited to bright outdoors shots, right? So it's for somebody that's using pictures, that's taking pictures in that environment. Now, because it's not as sharp from 60 to 150 as it is from 50 to 600, I mean 150 to 600, People might say, well, why? why don't I just buy the 150 to 600? Well, that's a valid question, and you have to ask yourself that. There are two versions, a contemporary and a sport. The contemporary is just as good. It's not rugged. It's not uh, weatherproof. So it's going to be a little cheaper. And I think they're a little lighter. One might actually be a little heavier than this. I, I don't remember. But uh, just look at those specs. Um, but they're probably going to be a little lighter. And... What you're gonna get is you're gonna get sharper from 150 to 600 overall, and if that's all you need, it's definitely smaller in size. That's good too, because you can fit it in your bag if you're going hiking, you're going into the mountains. So that's something to keep in mind. Me personally, the way I shoot and the things I shoot, if I had the 150 to 600 at that air show, shooting the airplanes and the Blue Angels, when they landed and came really close to me, I could not have fit the whole airplane if I didn't have this 60 millimeter uh, to 600. 150 wouldn't have cut it and I would have been really disappointed. So I'm very, very happy that I got this 60 to, to 600. For me, it's perfect. I can keep this on if I'm gonna shoot things like an air show. Um, and if I need to go wide every once in a while, I can do it. Yeah, it's a little soft, but let me tell you something about that. We've gotten ridiculously spoiled. We are comparing ourselves now to, you know, uh, we're not comparing ourselves basically to like the 80s and 90s. And I know, right, why should we? Things have gotten better. But all I'm trying to say is in the 80s and 90s, we were perfectly fine with the lenses back then. The sharpest of the lenses was probably what I'm complaining about here. When I say 60 to 150, this thing is a little soft. It's not bad. It's just that we're spoiled and we expect everything to be sharp across the entire. And why not, right? We're paying good money. We do expect that. And companies need to try to deliver that. But I'm just telling you, don't be disappointed when I tell you that from 60 to 150, it's a little soft. It's not bad by any means. If you're using this lens for portraits, that's not even going to be a big deal. If you put it on 100 or 150 and you're out shooting a model in, uh, you know, in the woods or something outdoors, anywhere, 
uh, and it's a tad softer than it needs to be, that's okay for portraiture. That used to be wanted for portraiture. You would put a, a haze filter on, not a haze filter, a um, sometimes even a, a star filter, just to make things a little a little softer uh, when you focus the model, right? So don't don't knock the lens for that. It's um, it's a wonderful lens for the money. It's not a big deal. But if you insist on the ultra, ultra, ultra sharp throughout the whole range, then maybe it's not for you. As I mentioned, we're at the point of the video where we're going to show you some pictures and you can get to decide for yourself if this is a lens that you would consider. These pictures were very hard to take. I'm not saying that as an excuse for me. Um, it's more for credit for the lens. It was very dark, it was very cold, and it was rainy. And these planes were coming in and out of clouds. And this lens was reaching into the sky and pulling these planes out and making them look like they were right in front of me. Amazing, amazing quality. These pictures that I'm going to show you are downgraded in quality because I put them on Instagram. And, uh, so keep that in mind as well. Don't knock the lens. The lens did a fantastic job that day. And the weather sealing worked magnificently. With that said, now that you're going to embark on watching these pictures, I love you guys. Please take care of yourselves. Until the next video, ciao for now.